and welcome to Me Speaks and in this BNF bite size style video I'll be covering medicines that are used in type 2 diabetes and some key counselling points that go along with them. Now I have previously made a video about insulin so do go and check that out for more um, and for more general information regarding diabetes check out my endocrine video but this video is really going to focus on those different medicines used in um, type 2 diabetes and those key counselling points and monitoring parameters that are really important um, with those medicines. So in general, if dietary and lifestyle changes have not been sufficient in managing blood glucose levels, then our number one go-to would be metformin. That should be offered first um, for type 2 diabetes in adults. Now, if metformin is contraindicated or it's not tolerated, then we can go for a DPP4 inhibitor or a dipeptile pepti peptidase inhibitor should give a pre-warning that this video is going to be full of me trying to pronounce medicines. I know I have, I can't pronounce a lot of them, so please do bear with me, but I've given you the warning now. Um, so yeah, if metformin is contraindicated or not tolerated, then we go for DPP4 inhibitor, um, or could go for pyoglitazone, or could go for a sulfonylurea that may be considered as well. So let's start off with the general number one go-to, which is metformin. Now this should generally be titrated slowly um, and the dose adjusted according to the response. So typically one tablet is given daily for one week, then one twice a day for one week, and then maintained on one three times a day. It's important to monitor um, the renal function before treatment and annually, at least twice a year in patients who have additional risk factors for renal impairment. Metformin can lead to a buildup of lactic acid in the blood. This is known as lactic acidosis. Therefore, it's really important to advise patients on the risk of lactic acidosis. So if a patient experiences any muscle cramping or abdominal pain or dyspnea, then they should seek immediate medical attention. With all forms of metformin, it is recommended that it is taken with or after food. Um, modified release tablets, uh, they should be swallowed whole and not crushed or chewed. Uh, gastrointestinal side effects tends to be the, I guess, the, the most prominent side effect that patients on metformin experience. So ensuring that they take that metformin with or after food will really help with any gastrointestinal disturbances that they may have. And it's used usually for the first few weeks. Um, and as the body, I guess, tolerates metformin more, um, those uh, gastrointestinal side effects tend to subside. Now let's move on to sulfonylureas. So this is, for example, glycoside, glimepiride, glipliside, tolbutamide, um, and there is a risk of hyperglycemia with the sulfonylureas. So drivers, they need to be particularly careful, and it's usually more so with the long-acting sulfonylureas, such as um, glimepiride. And sulfonylureas are also associated with weight gain. So let's start off with glycoside. So modified release tablets of glycoside, it is recommended that they are swallowed whole, they are not crushed or chewed. Doses up to 160 milligrams can be given once a day with breakfast, but higher doses um, is recommended that they're actually given in divided doses. With glimepiride, doses should be taken shortly before or with the first main meal. Glipizide doses um, should be taken shortly before breakfast or lunch and doses up to 15 milligrams can be given as a single dose but again higher doses should be given in divided doses. And tolbutamide which is the only one that in the sulfonylureas that doesn't begin with a G, um, that doses should be taken with or immediately after meals. If it's a once daily dose, then taken with or immediately after breakfast is what's recommended. So with the sulfonylureas, it's really important to remember which ones should do, or which ones are recommended to be taken with or after food and which ones are recommended to be taken before food. 
So glycoside and tarbutamide are recommended to be taken after breakfast, whereas glimepiride is recommended to be taken shortly before a main meal. And with glipizide, um, it's recommended that that too should be taken before breakfast or lunch. So glycoside and tarbutamide are after breakfast, glimepiride and glipizide are before food. Now, before we go any further, are you looking for questions on every chapter of the BNF, including OTC scenarios? If the answer is yes, then do go check out Clinical Quizical. Links are in the description box below. I understand just how important it is to practice questions and to help highlight areas where your strengths are, but also areas that you may need to brush up on. So make sure to go and check that out. So now moving on to pioglitazone and with pioglitazone, I'd say there's three key um, points to remember with it. And that's to do with the liver, the bladder and the heart. So let's start off with liver. So liver function should be monitored before treatment and annually thereafter. So any signs of liver toxicity, whether that be nausea, abdominal pain, dark urine, fatigue, vomiting, um, if a patient experiences any of these whilst on pioglitazone, they should seek immediate medical attention. With bladder cancer, there, there is a small increased risk of bladder cancer with taking pioglitazone. However, it is important to note that if a patient responds well to treatment with pioglitazone, then the benefits outweigh the risk. Um, those who have a history of bladder cancer or currently have bladder cancer should not be taking it. Risk factors for bladder cancer should be assessed, such as age, smoking status, exposure to certain occupational agents. And if there's any urinary urgency or blood in urine, again, they, they should be promptly reported and um, medical advice should be sought immediately. And with pyogilitazone, it is contra contraindicated in heart failure as Again, there is an increased risk of heart failure when pioglitazone is given with insulin, particularly in patients who have, a, have risk factors for heart failure, such as a previous myocardial infarction. So now let's talk about the DPP-4 inhibitors, or the liptins, as I like to call it. So examples include alogliptin, linagliptin, citagliptin, saxagliptin, and vildagliptin. So they do not um, there doesn't really appear to be any association with weight gain um, when it comes to DPP-4 inhibitors and they have less incidence of hypoglycemia than the sulfonylureas, which is why if metformin is contraindicated, as we mentioned at, towards the beginning of this video, um, DPP-4 inhibitors would be a suitable alternative. However, um, if a patient on any of the DPP-4 inhibitors uh, experiences any symptoms of acute pancreatitis, for example, severe abdominal pain, then it should be discontinued. With alogliptin, linagliptin and saxagliptin, renal function should be measured before treatment and periodically after. With citagliptin, doses should be reduced depending on renal impairment. And with vildagliptin, there are rare reports of liver dysfunction. So again, if there are any signs of liver dysfunction, um, which we mentioned those signs and symptoms in the context of pyoglitazone, um, then medical attention should be sought. And liver function should be monitored every three months for the first year and then periodically after for somebody on vildagliptin. Now let's think about a carbose. So a carbose is an inhibitor of intestinal alpha glucosidases and it delays the digestion and the absorption of starch and sucrose. I know, that's quite a mouthful. The way that I like to remember is, it's a very simplistic way in that a carbose begins with A, it affects the intestinal alpha glucosidases, again, alpha begins with an A, and it delays the digestion and absorption, again, begins with an A. So a carbose, alpha and absorption. That's how I try to remember it. Now, tablets should be chewed with first mouthful of food or swallowed whole with a little liquid immediately before food. So it's really important that patients who are on our carbos, like with any of our medicines for type 2 diabetes, those patients are counselled properly. 
And in order to counteract any possible hyperglycemia, patients who take insulin or a sulfonylurea plus a carbose should carry glucose rather than sucrose because as we mentioned with a carbose, it delays the absorption and digestion of starch and sucrose. So any um, uh, to, to counteract any of that possible hyperglycemia, um, an individual should carry around glucose rather than sucrose. This is another one, not a fun one to pronounce there. Meglitinides. I think I actually pronounced that one okay. So netaglinide and rep repaglinide, um, they can be given around mealtimes or taken accordingly to a patient's eating habits. With replignide, it should be taken within 30 minutes before main meals. Moving on to the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors or SGLT2 inhibitors. So this is our flozin, so our canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and empagliflozin. And they may be suitable for patients when those first line options aren't appropriate. With canagliflozin and empagliflozin, they can be beneficial in patients with type two diabetes and have established cardiovascular disease. And the SGLT2 inhibitors are associated with a risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. So it's really important to remember um, what those signs and symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis is and that you, again, counsel patients accordingly. So any nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, weight loss, pear drop breath, anything like that, um, are, they could be, you know, signs and symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis. So make sure that you do counsel patients accordingly. This is another fun word that's going to be fun to say, which is fourniers. I'm really sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but fourniers gangrene. This is a rare but serious and potentially life threatening infection. Um, and it has been associated with the use of SGLT2 inhibitors. If fourniers gangrene is suspected, um, so that could be redness and swelling in an affected area, um, loss of sensation in an affected area, or sores or blisters or foul smelling pus. Um, the SGLT2 inhibitor should be stopped and urgent treatment would be required. So this could be, for example, antibiotics or even surgical intervention. Patients should be advised to seek um, urgent medical attention if they experience any severe pain, tenderness, swelling in the genital or perineal area, accompanied by a fever, um, urogenital infection or any perineal abscesses, they may proceed to necrotiating fasciitis. Renal function should be tested before treatment and annually thereafter. I think it's important to note at this point that with any medicine really, you don't want to scare patients in taking it. And there is of course that whole risk um, to benefit ratio that has to be taken into account. Um, and with medicines like, like the um, SGLT2 inhibitors, it is important to reassure patients, but do make them aware of, you know, these complications that could occur from taking this treatment and to counsel them accordingly, um, whilst at the same time we're trying not to scare them, which can actually be a really challenging task to do. And the more that you counsel patients, the um, I guess the easier it gets in being able to find a way and tailor language accordingly so that you are presenting the right information, but not scaremongering at the same time. But like I I want to point out it is really important to highlight um, these these different complications that can occur so that a patient is aware to look out for these in case it happens and to then seek medical attention um, urgently as required. So now let's move on to the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists or GLP-1s. Again, a bunch of medicines that have some funky sounding names. So examples include dulaglutide, exenatide, liraglutide, um, and lixisenatide. And these should be reserved for combination therapy when other options have failed. Something like liraglutide has proven to have cardiovascular benefit. It then therefore can be considered in patients who have type two diabetes and have established cardiovascular disease. So, 
With um, patients that are on this group of medicines, it's important that they're counselled on the risk factors and signs and symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis because it can cause serious and even life-threatening cases of diabetic ketoacidosis. It has been reported in patients, particularly those that are on GLP-1 receptor agonists and insulin. Um, so again, if a patient develops any of those signs of diabetic ketoacidosis, then they should seek medical attention um, immediately. Patients should also be counselled on how to recognise signs and symptoms of acute pancreatitis, such as severe, persistent abdominal pain, and again, to seek medical attention if they experience these symptoms. So with dulaglutide, it should be prescribed and dispensed by the brand name and stored in the fridge, so two to eight degrees. Once it is open, it can be stored outside the fridge for up to 14 days at temperatures below 30 degrees. With dulaglutide and liraglutide, patients should be informed on the potential risk of dehydration in relation to gastrointestinal side effects and should be advised accordingly to make sure that they don't become dehydrated. With dulaglutide, if a dose is missed, then it should be administered as soon as possible, only if there are at least three days until the next scheduled dose. In cases where there are less than three days remain before the next dose, then the missed dose should be omitted and the next dose should be taken at the normal time. With exenatide, women of childbearing age should use effective con contraception during treatment with modified released exenatide and for 12 weeks after discontinuing it as well. Um, patients that are changing from a standard release to a modified release formulation may experience some initial um, increase in blood glucose. Some oral medicines should be taken at least one hour before or four hours after an exenatide injection. So this is really important to make patients aware, um, especially if they're on other medicines as well as exenatide. And if a dose of the immediate release medicine is missed, then the next scheduled dose should be taken, but it should not be taken after a meal. And with liraglutide, manufacturer advises that this is stored in the fridge, so two to eight degrees after its first use, and it can be stored below 30 degrees and used within one month. Um, and it's important to keep the cap on the pen um, on there to protect it from light. If a dose is more than 12 hours late, the missed dose should be omitted and the next dose should be taken at the normal time. And with lixisenatide, it's a similar situation to that as exenatide, where some medicines or medicines may need to be taken one hour before or four hours after a lixenatide um, injection. With a missed dose, it should be injected within an hour before the next meal and should not be administered after a meal. So I hope you found this video useful and if you did, please do give it a thumbs up, share, like, subscribe, do also visit my Instagram, Twitter and Facebook and until next time, good luck with your revision and happy revisings!